Okay, welcome everyone to this latest edition of uh, the California Law Review's Democracy Reform Symposium. We are having some fun technical difficulties. It was bound to happen. Looks like we are getting our panelists in. So thank you all for joining us. There we go. There is Professor Levitt. Welcome. Hi, thank you. We're just waiting on Professor Ross. I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Casey Reed. I am a 3L at Berkeley Law and I am a CLR symposium editor. My pronouns are she, hers. And I will mostly not be talking on uh, this Zoom. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mallory, who is another CLR member who's going to be our wonderful moderator for this panel. And we're just waiting on Professor Ross our intrepid facilitator. <laughs> and so um, maybe we'll just give him a minute to join and then Mallory, you can go ahead and start and everyone can get their lunch or their coffee or whatever they need to do. Oh, there you go, and your Diet Coke. There he is, Professor Ross. Welcome, sorry about that. Hey, it's okay, just challenges. Um, I I hate, I hate that your panel was the one panel that had the technical difficulties. So I'm that's excited. me. I'm sure that's me. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but Professor Levitt, I was going to say you were able to join every other panel except your panel. Yeah, and I finally um, decided I wasn't wanted popping up in all these other places, and so the band okay. is what made it a problem. <laughs> okay, well, well, I'll just I'll just repeat myself really quickly. Um, I am Casey okay. Reed. I'm the symposium editor of the Law Review, and I am going to hand it over to Mallory our uh, moderator, who is another CLR member, and Mallory is going to introduce our facilitator and um, go through just some of the logistics of the panel, and then we're off. So I'm gonna go away now. Thanks, Mallory. Thank you, Casey. So hi, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the panel. This panel is called Principle Two. It's Every Vote Should Count Equally. My name's Mallory. I'm a 2L here at Berkeley, and my pronouns are they, then theirs. Before I turn things over to our facilitator and our panelists, I kind of just want to let you know how this is going to work. At the end, we will have about 20 minutes left for a Q&A. You can submit your questions anonymously or ask them yourself. Also, this panel is going to be recorded and we will be sharing the recording on our website. So thank you for joining us. I would like to introduce our wonderful facilitator, Professor Ross. Professor Ross is the Chancellor's Professor of Law here at Berkeley Law where he teaches legislation, election law, and constitutional law. His research interests are driven by a normative concern about democratic responsiveness and a methodological approach that integrates political theory and empirical social science into discussions of legal doctrine, the institutional role, role of courts, and democratic design. In the area of legislation, his current research seeks to address how courts should reconcile legislative supremacy with the vexing problem of interpreting statutes in contexts not foreseen by the enacting legislature. In election law, he is examining the constitutional dimensions and the structural sources of the marginalization of the poor in American political processes. Over to you, Professor Ross, to introduce our panelists and kick off the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mallory. It's great to see you. Um, it's great, great to see um, good friends, Nick and Justin here. Um, on this panel and, and appreciate your taking the time out of your busy schedules pre-election season to join the CLR um, Law Review on this symposium. Um, I'm Virtual Ross and, and I will um, start by introducing uh, the two panelists and then um, offer a brief couple of remarks and then kind of pass it over um, to the panelists to um, engage the discussion. So let me start with Professor Justin Levitt, Levitt who is a professor of law and Gerald T. McLaughlin um, fellow at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Angeles. He is a nationally recognized scholar of constitutional law and the law of democracy. From 2015 to 2017, he took a leave from Loyola to serve as the Deputy Assistant General, um, <laughs> Assistant General in the Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice, where he was responsible for enforcing federal voting rights and employment discrimination statutes. In addition to being a leading civil rights advocate, Professor Levitt is a prolific scholar, having published in the Harvard Law Review, the Columbia Law Review, the Georgetown Law Journal, and the peer-reviewed election law journal, among others. And finally, Professor Levitt created the website All About Redistricting that I highly recommend to everyone that is viewing this. 
Professor Levitt will be presenting on partisanship and redistricting. Um, the second panelist is Professor Nicholas Stephanopoulos. Nick is a professor of law at Harvard Law School, having recently moved from the University of Chicago Law School. Prior to becoming a professor, he worked on election law related issues at the on, uh, such election law related issues such as issues related to the Voting Rights Act, while in private practice at Jenner and Block in Washington D.C. During that time in private practice, he also served as a volunteer attorney for the Obama for America campaign. Like Professor Levitt, Professor Stephanopoulos is a leading election law scholar, having published in the Harvard, Stanford, and Columbia Law Reviews, among many others. Professor Steph Stephanopoulos is also actively involved in ongoing litigation, having produced briefs and, supported, and, and having supported litigation in the recent partisan gerrymandering cases, among others. Professor Stephanopoulos will be presenting on what it would mean to change the unit of apportionment from total population to citizen voting age population. Now, the topics that they'll be engaging are critical at this particular moment as we enter a new cycle of redistricting following the 2020 census. And um, based on um, a constitutional decision back in 1964 called Reynolds v. Sims, um, states are required to maintain one person, one vote in their districting practices, meaning that every vote should count equally. But as we've learned, it's for every vote to count equally, more is required than simply equal apportionment of districts. Um, we need to also think about how do we address problems of vote dilution, partisan gerrymandering, partisan dilution, among others. But there are still basic principles that go to basic issues that go to the one person, one vote um, principle that um, need to be addressed as well, such as what is the proper denominator for measuring population equality. And so Nick will be engaging the latter question um, and Justin will be engaging the former question dealing with partisan gerrymandering and partisanship and redistricting in particular. So let me um, turn it over to Justin to lead our discussion. Thanks very much, Professor Austin. Thank you so much uh, to the California Law Review for hosting this symposium. Um, we wish that we could could have been with you all in person when I know this was originally scheduled for the spring. Um, we wish we could all be in person with you now. And we know uh, there's been a tremendous amount of disruption just in your pulling all of this together. And so really appreciate the efforts. Um, it's, uh, it's nice to be with you, um, even if it's virtual. Um, I'm going to use a uh, faculty member's crutch and actually share my screen uh, if I can, um, if Julianne will allow me. Uh, to show the screen for a presentation. While I do, I'm going to call Professor Ross out on claiming that this is pre-election season. Uh, we are very much in election season and have been in election season for some time. And that is part of the difficulty or concern, right? The pandemic has actually exposed a lot of ways in which we conduct our elections that needed fixing before the pandemic that still are going to need fixing afterward. Um, because the election season, we're in it, and it has responded uh, unevenly, um, to say the least. Uh, I think, and that was the first panel of the morning, by the way, talking about exactly that. Uh, the pandemic's influence and impact on the census and on some of the political maneuvering around the census um, has also exposed fault points in the representation that we received. And that also needed fixing beforehand, and we'll need plenty of fixing afterward. Um, both Professor Stephanopoulos and I, I think, have presentations related to that, related to the fault lines that have been exposed by some of the gamesmanship uh, going around around representational issues. Um, and with that, thank you, Julianne. I will hope that this actually uh, lets you all see a very pretty black slide. Um, which will be much prettier than me, which is why I've got a slide up. Um, so an enormous amount of the recent manipulation around the census and around the representation that we receive generally is designed for partisan gain, to reward partisan friends and punish partisan enemies. Where the lines themselves are drawn, and we're learning the very data used to draw the lines, are subject to deep partisan distortion. That's a real problem. It's of deep interest, of course, to partisans who are on the wrong side of that stick. So, for example, in North Carolina, in 2008, the presidential election was about as razor thin as it could get. In 2012, it wasn't much more of a disparity. Um, the Senate race in 2014, 
47% to 49%. The 2016 governor's race, 49% to 48.8%. North Carolina is purple, deep purple. And I've shown you the 2012 uh, presidential results by precinct to show you that it's purple across the state. There are pockets of red and pockets of blue. This actually undersells how purple North Carolina is because this is based on geography and not people. A big part of the problem with any map that's not a cartogram. Um, so what this shows is distorted a bit. You've got to expand the really narrowly clustered blue bits and expand the really narrowly clustered red bits to know how purple North Carolina is deeply throughout the state, which is to say it's possible, plenty possible, to draw districts that reflect the partisan alignment in North Carolina. That is not what North Carolina chose to do. In 2016, as Nick knows painfully well, uh, I'll get back to his role in all this in a second, not in creating it and fighting back against it. Um, the Republican committee chair said, I propose that in this purple state, we draw the maps to give a partisan advantage to 10 Republicans and three Democrats. Why? Because I don't think it's possible to draw a map that's 11 to two. Right? That's the overriding instinct. And if you're a Democrat on the other side of that, this partisan impulse feels painful. P.S. This is not just a Republican problem. You go back to Texas in the 90s moving into the 2000s and you see both parties doing it to each other. First, an egregious de Democratic gerrymander, uh, gerrymandering Texas, and then an egregious Republican gerrymander responding. Um, those two wrongs don't make it right. Each opposing partisan actor uh, felt that they weren't receiving representation based on the way insiders drew the lines for partisan purposes. But I want to be abundantly clear. This discussion of how ingrained partisanship is and how troublesome it is, does not just affect people based on their partisan identity. So in Texas, uh, the attorney for Maldef, who took the 2003 redistricting to the Supreme Court, described her role as sitting in that tiny orange car, just trying to get noticed. She represented Maldef, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And she was trying to pursue just representation on behalf of her Latino clients, feeling like she was, her description, a tiny little VW bug between two giant partisan semis. And sitting in Los Angeles, uh, a Ninth Circuit case in the 90s recognized that Elected officials engaged in the single-minded pursuit of what they called incumbency, I'll say partisan advantage has the same trait, can and often do run roughshod over the rights of protected minorities. So the massive impulse to secure partisan advantage is not only doing opposing partisans harm, it's running through everything else. It is in some ways limiting uh, the representation of communities of color regardless of what party they favor. It's also true that if you're drawing districts purely for partisan purposes and ignoring everything else, or at least putting everything else as second choice, then what that does is create districts that don't have real communities at their core, where the only thing the voters can evaluate is whether their representative is a D or an R. That is, there's nothing else for the voters to hold their representatives accountable for. Because if the only reason the district has been drawn is to produce a D or an R, and there's no other sense to the communities that are being represented in the district, the only option come election time is say, yep, that's a D, or yep, that's an R. There's no other way to hold your representative accountable. That is, unfortunately, the status quo and has been for quite a while. There have been a few fights over the past couple of years to push back against the status quo in federal courts, in state courts, in explicitly changing the rules in uh, state constitutions um, or in state legislation, usually through ballot initiatives. Um, Nick was one of the leading lawyer scholars involved in at least two of these cases and, and a whole bunch more uh, in Wisconsin and then in North Carolina. There had been a string of success from about 2016 through 2019, and Nick, I'm sorry about this, I know this one's painful, uh, of federal courts recognizing that this abundant, this egregious partisanship was a real problem. Unfortunately, the tale ends badly. In 2019, last year, the Supreme Court said that partisan gerrymandering claims were non-justiciable in federal court. 
is actually worse than that. They said, not only are we not going to adjudicate these matters, but in a little bit of incredibly harmful dicta, they also said a little bit of partisan manipulation actually seems just fine to us, seems constitutional to us. And that is, as far as I can tell, outside of um, a very small wing of political patronage cases where high level uh, policy appointees can be appointed based on their partisanship. That is the first time that the Supreme Court has said outright, the Constitution makes it okay for the government to punish you based on what party you belong to, at least if it's only a little bit. So needless to say, I think this outcome was dead wrong. I'm pretty sure Nick joins me in that. Um, the fight has now gone to state courts uh, and state courts have picked up the ball a little bit. State courts last cycle in Florida and in Pennsylvania and then eventually in North Carolina held that it was unconstitutional under the state constitution to draw extreme partisan gerrymanders. There will be more of these. More state constitutional fights are coming. There have also been efforts in ballot initiatives, direct democracy pushing back against this. You heard Professor Daniels this morning mention work at the state level with respect to casting a ballot. The same is true with respect to representation. Some of these changes uh, change the structure of who's drawing the line. So they try to put control in the hands of a more independent or more bipartisan body, or they impose super majority requirements to try and guard against purely partisan mischief. Um, some of these models also write explicit rules against partisan gerrymandering into state constitutions or state legislature. Um, most of those take the characteristic of or, or look like prohibitions against undue partisan gerrymandering. That is, don't speed too much. Some of them actually affirmatively uh, talk about it in terms of an optimal speed. Rather than saying don't speed too much, they say we want you to be going exactly 45 um, or as close to 45 as you can get. They build in affirmative measures for partisan balance uh, and or in some cases competition in districts. There are a number of diverse proposals for how to deal with this partisanship problem. But if I'm following yesterday's lead, and this will be quick, uh, another five minutes of presentation, because I want to give Nick uh, time to present, and then I really want questions. If I'm following yesterday's lead in the exhortation to be bolder, to think about a 21st century, a change in the way that we conduct representation, I think all of these are second best protections. That's not actually as much of a ding as it might sound. A lot of states can't even get this far. Some state courts won't ever make the step that Florida and North Carolina and Pennsylvania have done. Um, some states don't allow ballot initiatives to put back against uh, the, the existing legislative incentive to gerrymander on partisan grounds. And so a lot of this represents the best possible, most achievable protection at the time. But I'd like to be even bolder because I think actually that the push to draw districts based on party is so powerful that it has the capacity to overwhelm almost everything else. It takes up all of the oxygen in the room, even with these incentives in place. And it squeezes out all of the other reasons why we might want to uh, devise rules for districts that represent real communities. In state court, for example, if the state courts are going to enforce a constitutional limit, there's still the gap between the limit and enforcement capacity. And that's gonna encourage people to speed right on up to the line. Bipartisan structures or multipartisan structures can create the incentive to draw bipartisan locked down districts. And explicit rules against drawing districts for a favor, or even worse from my perspective, explicit rules about optimizing partisanship can actually suck all of the oxygen out of the room too. If you're trying to get to an ideal level of legislative delegation level partisanship or district level partisanship, in order to do that, you're gonna have to squeeze a lot of other things that we might care about, like real communities that don't fit neatly into partisan patterns, like Voting Rights Act compliance, things like that. You're gonna have to squeeze a lot of that out of the system or at least put an awful lot of pressure. And so I actually think 
that not only is undue partisan gerrymandering part of the problem, but that if you step back, trying to aim at districts at a particular partisan composition might also be part of the problem, even if it's a good quote unquote composition. Um, I got a bunch of slides here that talk about why trying to do this at a district level doubly makes no sense. Um, if what you're really after is a fair delegation representative structure, uh, it turns out that competitive districts, for example, don't mean what people think they mean, that they don't actually produce moderation in campaigns, and that they don't actually produce much moderation in governance, or at least there's heavy social science pushback on the notions that they might. But I'm gonna skip those slides, I can show them to you later. Because what I really wanna spend my last two minutes doing is talk about the thing that I'd like to present as the way forward, the way that Alexander the Great, passing into modern day central Turkey in Gordium, decided that he would unravel the Gordian knot just by slicing it with a sword rather than trying to pick at the strands. It's to actually learn from the systems of other states that have limited, not eliminated, but have limited the incentives to drive partisanship through individual districts. A structure called mixed member proportional systems essentially allow you to elect candidates, that's what's going on on the right, from individual local districts. But they also allow you to elect parties and they use that partisan preference to fill up the cup so that the overall legislative delegation is roughly proportional to what the overall population wants. This is a system that's now used in Germany and Bolivia and Lesotho and Thailand and South Korea and New Zealand. That's the ballot you see in front of you is actually from New Zealand. Um, and a bunch of subnational governments like Scotland and Wales. So New Zealand, Scotland, and Wales, Canada has been flirting with it forever. Uh, this is not something that's unknown in the Anglo-American tradition. Um, it's just something that's incredibly foreign to most American citizens. And the way that it works is it takes the seats that you've won in individual races, whatever their partisan composition may be, and then uses the overall party preference to fill in the delegation as a whole to fill in those blank circles so that you add to the individual seats, whoever they might be, and come up with a legislative delegation that more proportionally represents the public. Um, this is not a panacea, it's not perfect, but it's something that we've sort of lost in terms of muscle memory in thinking about as an option for the future. The path from here to there is hard. And I am not suggesting that this starts with Congress or even with large state legislatures. But it should be on the menu for discussion, I think. And it should be something we can seriously contemplate giving voters experience with in local elections, particularly local elections that are partisan local elections, which is not everywhere, but is still a bunch of places. This might help take some of the gas out of tailoring every district to respond primarily to partisanship so that we can actually draw districts that take care of all of the other things we also care about without sacrificing the enormously strong partisan impulses we have. And with that, I've babbled on for longer than I wanted to, so I will turn this, I will stop sharing my screen and share my time with Nick. Great, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Justin, thank you to the California Law Review for organizing this uh, terrific symposium uh, under the most difficult imaginable circumstances. Uh, I'm in awe of uh, all your hard work in, in piecing this together, uh, and I thank you for that. Um, thanks, Justin, for, for reopening some old wounds uh, in the, uh, the Wisconsin and North Carolina partisan gerrymandering cases. Um, well, I really do applaud Justin for calling our attention to uh, mixed member proportional systems. Uh, these days, the reformer focus has been on uh, multi-member rank choice districts, uh, which I think also have a lot to commend them, but uh, I don't think that they are you know, clearly and obviously uh, the best uh, alternative approach to the status quo. Um, and I think that uh, MMP systems like New Zealand or the German system have a lot uh, in their favor as well. And so it's uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, belongs uh, uh, on the agenda. 
Um, let me now uh, share my own screen, uh, as, as law professors are wont to do. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today uh, about what might be the most dramatic redistricting development of the next redistricting cycle, which is a uh, potential switch by certain states in their unit of apportionment uh, from total population to citizen voting age population. Uh, just so we're all on the same page, when I refer to the unit of apportionment or the apportionment base, uh, I'm referring to what it is that is equalized in numbers uh, from one district to another. Uh, we know that something has to be equalized under the one person, one vote rule. Uh, the question is what that something should be. Um, until now, it's almost universally been total population, uh, persons who have been equalized. Uh, there's now a possibility in the next cycle that uh, certain states will begin to equalize citizen voting age population, or CVAP, uh, instead. And so this is a co-authored uh, a project with Joey Chen, who's a political scientist at the University of Michigan, uh, on what the potential consequences of switching the unit of apportionment might be. Uh, we'll look at the potential consequences for both minority representation and partisan representation. Um, so I'll give some background for a few minutes, and uh, then I'll present our preliminary empirical results uh, focusing on Texas, which has been the fulcrum of a lot of this discussion, but then also presenting some results for uh, a broader set of states. Uh, let's see. Okay, great. Um, so among those who uh, pay attention to uh, such minutia as the unit of apportionment, um, there is a pretty wide-held expectation that switching the unit of apportionment from uh, total population, or TPOP, uh, to CVAP, would reduce the numbers of districts electing minority preferred candidates and would also reduce the numbers of districts electing democratic uh, candidates. Uh, here, for example, is a quote from legendary Republican gerrymanderer Tom Hoffler, also the author of the North Carolina plan that was at issue in last year's Supreme Court case. Uh, he writes, a switch to the use of citizen voting age population as the redistricting population base for redistricting would be advantageous to Republicans and non-Hispanic whites. Uh, Hans von Spakovsky, not as much of a redistricting expert, but uh, certainly a uh, conservative activist in this area, writes that CVAP equalization would cause a noticeable shift toward Republicans and away from urban districts in parts of the country with large non-citizen populations. Um, so why do people think this? Uh, what explains the confidence of folks like Hoffler and von Spakovsky that uh, switching the unit of apportionment would benefit uh, Republicans and uh, reduce minority representation? Um, the answer is that there's a widespread uh, view that uh, the non-eligible voter population isn't evenly dispersed across states. Uh, rather, people think that non-eligible voter population is concentrated in areas where lots of minority voters and democratic voters live. Uh, and if that's right, if there is that kind of clustering of the non-eligible voter population, then you might expect a switch to CVAP as the apportionment base to uh, end up requiring the squeezing of additional minority voters and Democratic voters into a smaller number of districts in order to hit the new CVAP population target. Um, by the same token, in areas where there are few non-eligible voters, uh, in those places you'd expect to find lots of white voters and Republican voters. Uh, and so with, with CVAP rather, rather than with total population targets, you would expect those white and Republican voters to be more efficiently dispersed across more districts, controlling more districts. So this is the dynamic that's hypothesized by folks like Hoffler and von Spakovsky. Uh, 
you know, without necessarily attributing motives to them, I think it's why they uh, actually advocate for a switch from TPOP to CVAP redistricting. We think it'll benefit uh, Republicans uh, in particular. Now, to be fair, there uh, is at least one serious non-partisan, non-political uh, uh, rationale for switching the unit of apportionment. Uh, it's a theoretical commitment to what I call here the theory of equal voter power. Uh, you see a quote from Westbury v. Sanders that seems to endorse this theory. As nearly as is practical, one man's vote is to be worth as much as another's vote. Um, the idea here is that every voter ought to be equal in electoral influence to every other voter. Uh, it shouldn't make a difference with respect to voter power, whether one lives in this district or that district. Uh, and so equalizing CVAP, which is a reasonable measure of the eligible voter population, uh, is thought to be a way to vindicate this value of equal voter power. Now note that the equal voter power uh, theory does not occupy the field. This is a highly theoretically contested area. Uh, there is another uh, a storied significant uh, theory, which we might call the theory of equal constituent representation. Here's a quote from the famous case of Reynolds v. Sims that seems to endorse that theory. Uh, the fundamental principle of representative government is one of equal representation for equal numbers of people. So here, this theory has nothing to do with voters. It says that persons, all persons, uh, ought to command the same representation. Um, and this theory is more consistent with equalizing persons across districts, uh, not with equalizing eligible voters across districts. And I'll skip this last point here. Uh, so what does the law have to say about equalizing CVAP versus equalizing total population? Uh, not a whole lot, it turns out. And I'll quickly run through the main legal development on this issue. Uh, the famous 1960s cases during the one person, one vote revolution uh, never really grappled squarely with uh, this issue. Um, as you saw in the previous slide, those cases were ambiguous, uh, both in Westbury v. Sanders and in Reynolds v. Sims, and in the other really landmark uh, decisions in this period, uh, some passages in the court opinions seem to uh, endorse equal voter power. Other passages, sometimes in the same paragraph, seem to endorse equal constituent representation. Uh, there was real ambiguity as to what it was that had to be equalized from one district to another. Um, there's one lesser known 1960s case that did address the unit of apportionment more squarely. Uh, so in Burns v. Richardson, Hawaii chose to equalize the number of registered voters in each district. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld that choice by Hawaii. And the Supreme Court also suggested in dicta that citizen population would also be an acceptable unit of apportionment. Citizen population is not identical to citizen voting age population, but they're pretty similar measures, all things considered. Um, then nothing happened for 50 years. Uh, between 1966 and 2016, uh, the Supreme Court never touched this issue. Uh, but in 2016, the court uh, uh, decided a pretty audacious claim by some plaintiffs in Texas who argued that uh, contrary to the practice of almost every jurisdiction over the last half century, in fact, the Constitution compels the equalization of CVAP across districts. And uh, the Evenwell Court unanimously rejected that challenge. But the court also left open the question of whether courts, uh, whether uh, states could, as a matter of their own discretion, choose 
to equalize CVAP instead of total population. Uh, so seizing that opening, the Trump administration over the last few years has done everything in its power to make uh, CVAP data available to states to uh, uh, use in redistricting the next cycle. Uh, the Trump administration tried to add a citizenship, a citizenship question to the census, which would have made possible uh, very detailed CVAP data. Uh, when that effort was thwarted, the uh, Trump administration uh, uh, launched a campaign to produce CVAP data by consulting a range of different governmental databases. Um, and it remains to be seen uh, how successful that effort will be, but it's ongoing. Um, so given this effort by the Trump administration and given the opening presented by Evenwell, it seems uh, plausible and perhaps likely that at least some states will take the plunge and uh, switch their unit of apportionment from uh, total population to CVAP in the next cycle. Um, so here's how Joey and I are studying the uh, potential implications of such a move. Uh, we're only looking at states with below average uh, shares of citizen voting age persons. Uh, these are the states where a switch from total population to CVAP uh, could make the biggest political difference. Um, and this includes you know, big diverse states like California, Florida, Illinois, New York, uh, and Texas. Um, we're looking at state house districts, not congressional districts, uh, for the reason that state house districts are so much more numerous than congressional districts. Uh, and so they enable a much more fine-grained, uh, detailed study. Uh, and our basic approach is to use Joey's uh, computer expertise to simulate large numbers of equal TPOP and equal CVAP maps for each state in our uh, data set. And then once we've uh, generated those large numbers of districts, we'll compare their uh, respective numbers of minority opportunity districts and of Democratic and Republican districts. Um, and just a terminological point, by minority opportunity districts, I'm referring to districts where minority voters are uh, numerous and cohesive enough to elect their preferred candidates uh, to office. Um, in our simulations, we use the following criteria. Uh, total population deviation of either TPOP or CVAP below 10%, consistent with Supreme Court precedent, uh, as few split counties as possible, as many reasonably compact minority opportunity districts as possible, and uh, a district map on the whole whose districts are at least as compact on average as the districts we see in the state's actual enacted plans. Um, and I'll skip that little point. Um, and just to demonstrate that the uh, criteria that we specify for the algorithm are actually being followed, uh, here you can see the average district compactness of our simulated maps, both the TPOP simulations and the CVAP simulations. Those are all the gray circles in the charts. And you can also see uh, red stars uh, denoting the average district compactness of the enacted plans uh, in these states. Um, in every single case, our simulated maps are at least as compact and sometimes a bit more compact on average uh, than the enacted plans. Okay, so what do we find? Here are the results for Texas. I'll, I'll zoom in on Texas because it's, uh, it was the site of the Evenwell litigation. It's a very big state, and it's also the state with the lowest CVAP uh, percentage in America. So here you see distributions of uh, African-American opportunity districts in our uh, total population simulations, that's in blue, and in our CVAP simulations, uh, that's in red. And you see a pretty significant decline in the number of black opportunity districts uh, from a median of 37 in the TPOP simulations to a median of 30 in the CVAP uh, simulations. 
Uh, here's an analogous chart for Hispanic opportunity districts in Texas. Um, and again, you see a decline in the number of Hispanic opportunity districts between the TPOP simulations and the CVAP simulations. Uh, there are about two fewer Hispanic opportunity districts uh, in the CVAP simulations. Um, on the whole, this is quite a big deal. Uh, a decline in nine minority opportunity districts uh, would wipe out something like two decades of diversification of the Texas state legislature. Um, all of that would happen just by changing the unit of apportionment uh, in Texas. Uh, what about Republican districts and Democratic districts in Texas? Uh, well, here in blue, you see the uh, distribution of Republican districts in the TPOP simulations. And in red, you see the distribution of Republican districts in the CVAP simulation. And uh, there's an increase, uh, a median increase of eight Republican districts between the TPOP simulations and the CVAP simulations. Um, that's also quite a big deal. That's a bigger impact than you typically get from partisan gerrymandering, uh, the subject of Justin's uh, presentation. Um, uh, this impact would also make the Texas State House uh, comfortably Republican instead of Republican by the skin of its teeth. So this would be a very big partisan impact uh, in addition to being uh, a large impact on uh, minority representation. Now, um, Texas uh, might plausibly be uh, an outlier because of its unusually large uh, non-eligible uh, voter population, um, and also because Texas uh, white voters tend to be quite Republican, which might be driving the partisan results that I showed you. Um, so uh, let me also present to you our uh, results uh, for both minority representation and partisan representation uh, across all 10 states that we studied. Um, here you see the shares of uh, combined African-American and Hispanic opportunity districts uh, in both the TPOP uh, simulations and the CVAP simulations. Um, and it turns out that Texas is rather aberrational. Uh, it's a common pattern for the CVAP simulations to feature fewer opportunity districts than the TPOP simulations, uh, but usually the difference in the proportion of opportunity districts is more on the order of two or three percentage points. Uh, the gap between the two simulation sets in Texas is one of the largest, one of the two largest uh, of any of the states that we examined. Um, so looking more broadly, we would say that switching the unit of apportionment uh, would tend to result in a substantial decrease in minority representation, but maybe not an overwhelming or, or catastrophic decrease in minority representation. Uh, and if anything, the story is even less dramatic when it comes to partisan representation. Uh, so here you see the distributions of uh, Republican districts in uh, the, uh, the TPOP simulations, those are in blue, and the CVAP simulations uh, in gray. And you can see that in most states, there isn't that much of a difference in the shares of Republican districts uh, between the TPOP simulations and the CVAP simulations. Um, Texas, again, stands out in that there's a, a significant difference between the two simulation sets. Uh, but in most other places, the Republican advantage is uh, small or even non-existent, you know, one percentage point, uh, give or take. Um, but just to summarize the takeaways, with respect to minority representation, changing the unit of apportionment across all these states would result in a substantial but not a huge decrease in minority representation. Um, certainly, it would have less effect than dramatic earlier legal and political developments like the enactment of the Voting Rights Act or the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Voting Rights Act in Thornburg v. Jingles um, or the diversification of American society. Uh, switching the apportionment base 
would not be on the same level as those uh, really momentous earlier developments. With respect to partisanship, it's even less of a dramatic story. Uh, in the median state in our study, uh, switching the unit of apportionment would only result in one percentage point more Republican districts. Uh, that's quite a small increase. It's quite a bit smaller than the usual boost that the line drawing party gets from deliberate partisan gerrymandering. Uh, but this overall picture masks uh, some very different results in uh, Texas, most notably, where uh, the consequences of switching from TPOP to CVAP would be quite dramatic, both for minority representation uh, and for partisan representation. Um, last little thing that I'll uh, shut up and uh, I'll yield the floor for questions. Um, Joey and I are working on a couple more analyses uh, as part of this project that I'll just flag right now, but we're not uh, actually finished with them. Uh, one is to um, respond to the critique of this analysis that our redistricting algorithm here has been a nonpartisan algorithm, but in reality, as Justin pointed out, uh, many map makers are uh, staunchly partisan. And so we're rerunning uh, all of our analyses of minority and partisan representation uh, while emulating the behavior of a Democratic or Republican gerrymanderer. So for these analyses, we're instructing the algorithm to do everything else we've it before, but also maximize the number of Democratic or Republican districts. Um, and we'll see what happens then to uh, the, the consequences of switching the unit of apportionment. Uh, the other ongoing uh, analysis of ours is to uh, determine whether it's possible to simultaneously equalize total population and CVAP across the districts in a map. Uh, some mathematicians have shown that uh, in theory, this is always possible with contiguous districts. Um, however, the mathematicians only considered contiguity as a constraint on the districts. Uh, no one knows how feasible simultaneous equalization is if districts also have to be compact to respect county boundaries, to comply with the Voting Rights Act, and so on. Um, and that's what we're investigating now. The payoff here is that if it is possible to equalize both TPOP and CVAP at the same time, uh, that might uh, arm future plaintiffs with a very useful argument, which is that, uh, you know, okay, Texas, you wanted to switch to uh, CVAP for apportionment, you know, great, but you should have also simultaneously equalized total population uh, across your districts. Uh, and guess what? Had you done so, you would have still been able to satisfy all of your nonpartisan goals, like splitting few counties, like drawing compact districts, uh, and like complying with the Voting Rights Act. So we don't know yet if that payoff will be there, but uh, if simultaneous equalization is possible, uh, that's the, the potential legal payoff. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Nick. And we have um, several questions in the queue. And again, I invite everyone that's in the audience um, to add their questions to the Q&A part of the uh, Zoom platform. But I want to start with just a question for both um, one directed at Justin and one directed at Nick. I'll start with um, Justin um, in your mixed member population uh, proportion districts. And um, you describe it as a means to reduce the incentives to tailor districts in a particular way of partisan advantage. But I guess a lot of people are concerned about what underlies that tailoring for partisan advantage and is the concern about partisan polarization. And do you see um, mixed member proportional districts having anything to uh, limit or doing anything to limit or reduce polarization? I know there's quite a bit of debate about the relationship between gerrymandering and polarization. Um, and maybe mixed member proportion districts might not have anything to do to limit it, but I wonder if you have thoughts on whether there is any relationship that you can derive between the two. Yeah, that's a great question. And like I was watching the other questions in the Q&A, spectacular questions coming up there. So I'm gonna make this short because I wanna get to as many of them as possible. Um, the short answer is 
that I'm not aware of studies that have tracked the implementation of mixed member proportional districts against polarization of the public in some of the countries that have uh, actually engaged in the system. Um, so I don't know of the empirical answer behind that. I can tell you my instinct is that like many reforms, it's not gonna solve the problem. Um, certainly not by itself. Uh, a lot of polarization and the instinct of polarization is elites leading, but an awful lot is people following. And so uh, in a way, the best way to solve the, the abject extreme polarization that we have now, and PS have had for much of American life, the 30s roughly through the 70s was a weird period of lower polarization than we have had historically in this country. We, we start polarized, we continue polarized, we dip down for a little bit, um, and not everybody is involved in the electorate at the time that we're considering that we dip down polarization. So um, mostly you gotta look to us. We gotta fix that more than the system fixing that. But I think that a mixed member system that allows you to vote not only for your local legislator, but also for a party, and that says to voters, don't worry, your partisan preference is gonna get taken care of. If you want a democratic legislature and the rest of the state wants a democratic legislature, you'll get that. Or if you want a Republican legislature and the rest of the state wants that, you'll get that. That takes a little bit out of the, of the gas off needing to confirm your team membership with every vote you cast. And it makes it okay to split your ballot, to prefer a party overall but a person of perhaps a different political party, if they seem like a good local representative to you, it makes it more okay. It doesn't stop the incentive to continue voting full team, and there are lots of psychological uh, reasons why people vote their team and only their team, but it gives permission for voters who might be inclined to split their ballot and choose uh, voters of, of different parties without needing to understand that if they do that, they're giving up their representation in the legislative delegation. And so it might make it permissible for people to learn that the opposing team's not that bad after all, that they can have dual preferences. So a little bit, I think. Thank you. And I guess a question for, a question for Nick before we kind of open it up to the rest of the audience is, um, you addressed, you preempted one of my questions in terms of nonpartisan redistricting, which, um, you know, we perhaps would see an independent redistricting commission states, but not in most other states. But I, I, I noted a, a, a couple sort of responses to your data findings. I noticed the curious omission of California from um, any of the graphs. And given that this is a CLR um, symposium, I'm sure people are curious as to um, what are the results with respect to California. And I guess a second question is, do you expect things to be different in congressional districts, given that they're larger and therefore you need more minorities to, con 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 to con constitute a minority opportunity district? Um, and um, I don't know if you ran any um, of the simulations with congressional districts. I understand why you would use state legislative districts, but do you expect um, that the results could be different with respect to congressional districts, given their size? Yeah, great, great questions, uh, Bertrand. Uh, so on the first question, uh, California is not included because my co-author, Joey, has been slow in updating charts to incorporate <laughs> California. Uh, it turns out that California was a tricky state for Joey to analyze in his simulations, uh, primarily because the California Commission, the Independent California Commission, uh, did such a great job uh, in complying with traditional nonpartisan criteria uh, that it's kind of hard for Joey's uh, uh, algorithm to match the performance uh, of the California Commission. In all, in all the other states, you know, the human gerrymanders uh, really sacrificed in terms of other criteria. And so it's pretty trivial for a computer to beat the enacted plan on all sorts of other measures, uh, but not in California. So uh, it took Joey an extra uh, month or so. He's now solved California too. We have uh, maps to satisfy all of our uh, parameters for California. Uh, but, you know, Tardy Joey has yet to update the summary figures to incorporate California. Uh, the results for California are a modest drop in the number of opportunity districts as you go from uh, TPOP to CVAP. Uh, the drop is two or three percentage points. So it's similar to the drop you see in New York uh, or in Florida, but uh, less than half the drop you see in Texas. 
Uh, and then really interestingly, no partisan effects in California. Um, you have the, the, the same distributions of Democratic and Republican districts, uh, both in the TPOP and the CVAP simulations. Um, so the, the partisan balance of power uh, in California wouldn't be affected by, uh, by a change in the unit apportionment. Super interesting how different the results are in California and Texas, uh, mm -hmm. given that they're the two states in the country with the, uh, the lowest CVAP shares uh, in their um, overall statewide populations. Um, in terms of analyzing state house rather than congressional districts, uh, the motivation is what I said before, like all of these analyses are, are just a lot better when you have lots of data points, not you know, three or 10 or you know, just a handful of districts uh, in a state. Um, I think your intuition is right that the effects would be more muted with uh, big congressional districts you know, it takes, uh, it takes more to, uh, to change the winner of a congressional district with 750,000 people than it does to change the winner of a state house district with, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 people. Uh, and so I think that you would see somewhat smaller consequences for both minority representation and partisan representation at the congressional level. Um, years ago, Joey had done a very rough version of the current project looking at congressional districts and found uh, next to no partisan uh, changes in all states other than Texas. And even in Texas, the difference in going from uh, total pop to CVAP was something like one and a half uh, seats. So he found a total nationwide impact on the partisan composition of the US House uh, from switching from uh, uh, TPOP to CVAP of maybe three Republican seats, which is a, a very small aggregate nationwide impact. Yeah, very fascinating. And thanks for, to both of you for your um, interesting presentations and, um, and, and projects going forward. Um, I want to turn it over to Alicia Arrington, who has a question for the panelists. Hi. Um, Thanks for answering the question and, and thank you guys for your presentation. Um, my name is Lisa Harris. That's my daughter. Um, <laughs> she does that every time. Um, but my question is uh, a little bit off topic, but it has to do with you know some of the gerrymandering and the things that you guys are speaking of, and that has to do with the two-party system. And so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, the limits of the two-party system in general, especially as we see parties like the Working Families Party or the Green Party or Tea Party or whatever it may be, experiencing challenges even getting on the ballot um, or for voters to even vote within those parties if they're not already registered. How does that impact some of the issues that you guys are talking about? Well, and then also, is there a non-binary future for our political system in general? Great questions. I'll, I'll take a stab. Uh, and then I know Nick has thoughts on this as well. Um, so the short version is there is if we want it, but we have to force it into being. Um, there was a different sort of alternative reform move uh, called fusion voting that was in place in large parts of the country uh, decades ago, and it's still in place in New York, but I think, I think at this point only New York. It's a procedure that allows you to vote, that allows, can, that allows parties to put their name on the same candidate. So you can have somebody who is the Democratic Party candidate and also the Green Party candidate or also the Working Party candidate. Um, what that does is it allows people to cast a preference for a political party without worrying that they're sacrificing the effectiveness of that vote for somebody who might actually win a plurality. Um, that's one way to do it. And that actually produced reliable sort of tallies. When somebody got elected as a Democrat, they knew, am I getting my support from old school Democrats or am I getting my support from working family member parties when they're elected as a Republican? Am I getting my support from Republicans or am I getting support from conservative or libertarian party members? Um, Earl Warren in California. California had fusion voting and Earl Warren was the Democratic and Republican nominee for governor. He won with something like 90% of the vote. Um, was also directly after his time as attorney general during Korematsu. And so a lot of controversy about whether uh, 
it was despite that or because of that. But there was fusion voting then that allowed multiple parties to combine without sacrificing their individual efficacy. That's within the current system, building minor party representation. The multi-member system I talked about is one other way, right? If you can vote for a candidate, but also a party, you might choose to vote for your local candidate who you know, might be a Democrat or Republican, but also vote for the Green Party or also vote for the Working Families Party. Or your local candidate might be a Green Party member, but you prefer the Democrats to have X representation in the legislature. So that's another way to let other third parties come into the system. Um, and you can set thresholds for what it takes to get legislative membership at whatever level you want. Really low thresholds mean lots of parties. Higher thresholds mean fewer parties. Um, there are other choices like ranked choice voting that similarly allow you to prep party preferences. They let you rank your choices. Number one, number two, number three, number four. And if your first choice doesn't work out, your ballot may still count for second, third, or fourth choice. That lets you vote your party preference without costing you an effective vote in what turns out to be um, a, a, a functionally two-party system. Those are all different ways to let minor parties blossom, to let third parties blossom. The Supreme Court, unfortunately, has said states can shut any or all of those down whenever they want in a truly misguided decision out of Minnesota. Um, if you ever want to see a really horrific uh, grade school misreading of the Federalist Papers, um, read Timmons versus the Twin City uh, New Party. And Timmons essentially takes James Madison's uh, urging against the mischief of faction, which meant don't get too dependent on parties, their problems, and converts it to it's really a problem when we have more than two parties, but two parties are great. It's, it's a horrible historic reading. Um, but it essentially lets states wipe all of those plans off the map if they want. So the short answer to, is there a way to break open the two-party duopoly, the really monolithic two-party du duopoly a little bit? Yeah, if we force it to happen at the state level, it's available. Um, it's just that the entrenched powers don't tend to see that in their interest. Um, I'll just have one little note to Justin's comments, which is that you know people often... Uh, look to electoral to solve all sorts of social and political problems. And usually the electoral rules aren't up to it. You know, if you want to solve polarization, if you want to solve the influence uh, of the wealthy, uh, you're not going to do it with, uh, with different electoral rules. It can help, but they won't really solve the, 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 the core of the problem. Um, the number of political parties, though, really is a function of the electoral rules in place. Uh, if, you ad if we adopted uh, uh, the, the system Justin was talking about, mixed member uh, proportional uh, voting, um, we would have a multi-party system uh, tomorrow. Uh, if we adopted multi-member districts with ranked choice voting, uh, we would have a, a multi-party system tomorrow. So, you know, unlike many other intractable uh, issues in our society, uh, the number of political parties is uh, easily manipulable if you change electoral rules. So let me turn it over to um, Raja Krishna, um, um, who has a question that I think is more directed at Nick than Justin. Uh, yes, um, Professor Stephanopoulos. Um, I was wondering, um, how do you define a um, minority opportunity district? Um, like if you could just give like a more mathematical definition, I guess, and then um, do you think your model sort of accounts for the fact that, at least in my perception, it seems like minority candidates are getting better and better at organizing in places where they haven't uh, traditionally won? Great question, Roger. I had the same question. Thank you. Uh, so the answer is uh, Joey ran a procedure known as ecological inference uh, for every single state that we analyzed. Um, using 2012 data, so somewhat dated uh, data at this point. Uh, the ecological inference uh, predicts um, turnout and voting behavior for uh, each racial group. Uh, uh, so for um, uh, white voters, Hispanic voters, and African-American voters. Um, 
So once you know uh, turnout and partisan preference uh, by group, um, uh, you can then figure out which districts are ones where minority voters are able to um, elect their preferred candidates. Uh, specifically, uh, our definition was that uh, the minority preferred candidate has to prevail and uh, minority voters have to outnumber, minority voters supporting that candidate have to outnumber uh, white voters supporting that candidate. Um, and if two different minority groups, so African Americans and Hispanics here, have to be combined to outnumber the, uh, uh, the non-minority supporters of the candidate, then you have to make sure that the Black and Hispanic voters have the same partisan preference. You can't be combining, for example, uh, Cuban Republican voters with uh, 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 Black Democratic voters in Florida. Um, so that's our definition. Note that we didn't use the crude definition of a 50% minority district. Uh, we were trying to look at uh, functionally what are the districts where minority voters in fact are able to elect their preferred candidates uh, without drawing any particular magic number at 50% or anywhere else. Okay. So this is a question from an anonymous person in the audience um, directed to both of you. Given the hostility of federal courts to redistricting and the increased polarization of our country, which can only make the already huge appeal of polarized districts that much more appealing, how can, we, how can we address the unequal treatment at the state level of the right to have one's vote count equally? So we're both talking about this issue, I think, um, and ours are not the only solutions. Uh, it takes, I, I think Nick pointed to this before, there are limits to what any individual electoral reform can do. There are also limits to what state courts will impose. Um, but there are relatively few limits to what people can organize. Uh, it is hard to get a ballot on the initiative, to get initiative on the ballot and to push it through to completion. And there have been, by the way, court pushback this year to at least three or four initiatives aimed at redistricting reform. Um, Courts in three or four states have kicked those things off of the ballot. Uh, so I am not pretending that it is an easy mark, but it is possible. Um, similarly, legislative reform, um, if you gotta go through the legislature, takes a lot of shoe leather. It takes a lot of footwork, but that too is possible. And using timing to your advantage can really help here. So one creative solution that happened in New York, I think, and we're going to see how this all plays out, um, was that in 2011, the people convinced Governor Cuomo to let the legislature have one last party, but at the same time to cut off their ability to gerrymander, at least anywhere near to the same degree, 10 years in the future. And one thing that I, I think anybody with any sort of political science uh, inclination knows, the, the the three other members of the panel certainly can verify. Um, the vast majority of state House members and state senators all think that they're going to be governor or US senator or president 10 years from now. Nobody thinks they're gonna ever have to deal with the district again. So they are more willing to trade away the future of somebody else's problem than their district tomorrow. And Governor Cuomo used that leverage to say, you get to draw your districts this time, but you gotta give me reform next time or I'm gonna veto anything you do. Um, he only did that because people demanded it of him. And so the short version of that is, it's hard to look to the courts for assistance. Um, both the courts and the legislative structures are easier when you've got real large scale mobilization on your side. And that's hard. And I'll, and I'll flag one, one more route for reform, uh, which may open next year, uh, would also be federal legislation. Um, so a lot of these problems uh, with, with redistricting and, and gerrymandering uh, are within Congress's power to, uh, to address. Uh, virtually all problems having to do with congressional redistricting, uh, Congress could largely resolve uh, with, with legislation. Um, I think Congress also has enormous power with respect to state legislative uh, redistricting abuses, both uh, partisan and racial. Um, that's a little bit more uh, contestable, but uh, you know, I, I think that also would be an argument worth having uh, uh, down the road. Um, so I think it's, it's really significant in my view 
that uh, the very first bill the Democratic House passed in uh, 2019 was HR1, which would have mandated really good independent commissions for uh, designing congressional districts in every single state. Uh, you know, certainly no chamber of Congress had ever done anything like that before HR1. Uh, so if Democrats were to retake uh, uh, control of all three branches, uh, all three you know, of the Congress and the presidency next year, um, I think it's you know, not certain but plausible that something like HR1 would be high on the Democratic agenda. Uh, and if enacted, uh, would be so much more potent than state by state initiatives and legislative battles and, uh, and litigation. Um, it would be even more potent than Supreme Court victories in the cases that I uh, helped to litigate. You know, all courts can do is strike down some of the worst outliers. Congress can affirmatively prescribe uh, visions of fairness for states to follow in redistricting. And, you know, HR1 did that. If something like HR1 becomes law, uh, that would transform congressional redistricting and maybe all redistricting overnight. I'll add one tiny thing to that, which is Nick's absolutely right. Um, don't assume that just because you elect people who promised something in the past that they'll deliver on that promise in the future. Um, we saw that in Virginia. There are a bunch of folks who decided they were all keen on reforming redistricting when it didn't matter, and then suddenly got very cold feet the moment it was their districts on the line. What that means, though, is engaging your representatives. And this is good practice, good hygiene, regardless. Members of Congress and state legislatures actually listen. They listen to phone calls more than they listen to emails. They listen to postcards more than they listen to phone calls, but they actually listen to their own constituents. Um, that also requires a lot of work, but if you hold their feet to the fire, sometimes you can make them get toasty enough to actually do some damage. And on that note, um, I think we are out of time now. This was a, a, a great um, presentation and engagement from Justin and Nick. I want to express my appreciation again to both of you um, coming on board and, and speaking with the audience, this virtual audience here. I think that there are a lot of people that are passionate about this issue in particular as we go forward and prepare for the next round of redistricting and what our democracy will look like. Um, and so thanks to the both of you um, for coming on board and I send my virtual clap and audience clap would be very loud right now. Um, and I will now turn it over to Mallory to give instructions as to what happens next. Thank you. And thank you for saying all of that, Professor Ross. Yes, just thanking everyone for coming and being on our panel today. I would just like to refer the audience members to bit.ly forward slash CLR Symposium 2020. If you'd like to register for any other panels, come listen to some of our other great panelists and to follow the conversation on Twitter at hashtag CLR Democracy Reform. Thank you for coming, everyone. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks. Take Bye. care.